back them up, boys. Hallelujah. Uh, let's take that word and open it to uh, Luke. I think one of my grandkids must have gave me this. It says high five on it. And I found out it makes a good bookmarker for my Bible because I, I can always find where that hand is there. Luke, the 16th chapter. I know I told you Luke, but I didn't tell you where. Um, does everybody have a spirit-filled life Bible? Well, then you're going to wish you had one. Does anybody else not have a spirit-filled life Bible? Okay. Not with you. I'm, I'm going to encourage you to start carrying your spirit-filled life Bible because you're going to find out that I'm going to uh, be reading quite a bit out of the, the notes over the next few weeks. Not being next week, of course, but um, and if you're carrying your telephone for your Bible, um, I would encourage you to start carrying your Bible so that you can mark in it. Um, in, uh, in, Mar in Luke, the 16th chapter, and, and what I'm going to teach on in the next few weeks, and this is, uh, it was the, the last song. We get a revelation of what the name of Jesus is by what? By praying and by reading the Word. You know, there's no, there's no uh, place that we can uh, replace reading the Word. There's no place that we can replace praying. They go hand in hand. One doesn't work without the other. Um, and as we, uh, as we read the Word, we begin to get revelation. And then the Holy Spirit, through our prayer time, and not just our prayer in, in uh, our known language, but in our, in our uh, unknown language or in other tongues as we pray. Uh, the Bible says in Jude chapter 20 that uh, we build ourselves up on our most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. So we realize, and I said Jude chapter 20, I mean Jude verse 20, because there's only one chapter in Jude. Um, and it's important for us to understand that when we pray in the Holy Ghost or pray in, in uh, our prayer language is, is we uh, most of the time call it. Um, and the reason that we do, we, we differentiate between the prayer language and we don't just say praying in tongues because a lot of times there's confusion that comes in the body of Christ that, well, I don't have that gift. Praying in, in our prayer language or praying in other tongues is not a gift. It's something that is the evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's something that we get with the Holy, with, with, the, uh, with the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The gift of tongues is part of the gifts of the Spirit, and it's always coupled with, with interpretation of tongues. So this is the place that, uh, this is the reason you'll find that most of the time I say praying in the Holy Ghost or praying in uh, your prayer language is simply so there's no confusion that comes between the two. Uh, that's something that's done. And, and more in uh, uh, places that they don't have an understanding of what the prayer language is, which I realize that, that I'm not in one of those places tonight. But, but somebody watching by Internet might uh, have a, a different uh, uh, teaching background. In uh, Luke chapter 16... Verse 14, 15, and 16 is what we're going to look at. And I wanted you to, ha if you had a Spirit-filled life Bible, I wanted you to, to have it because I'm going to read the note uh, that pertains to these verses, and particularly verse 16. And, and there's a reason for it. Don't you? The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, also heard all these things, and they derided him. Derided means literally turned up their nose at him. Uh, now, I thought this was significant because I looked all the way back, you know, and, and remember a few weeks ago uh, as I'm teaching on the end times on Sundays uh, that I talked about uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter, when it say, where it says in the last days, perilous times will come, men will be lovers of money. Well, we see that even the Pharisees were lovers of money all the way back in Jesus' time. In uh, 
verse 15, it said, uh, he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts for what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. You remember that, uh, that the Old Testament tells us that uh, uh, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And the Pharisees, as in today's world, religion does not fool anybody. Because it's our actions that speak louder than what we say we are or what we uh, profess to be. And uh, in, uh, because God looks on the, the heart, He knows exactly what's going on in us. Now verse 16 really is the one that we're going to concentrate on tonight and then we're going to go over into uh, Ephesians. I'm over the next few weeks realizing that... Uh, Would you get me some water, please, Mrs. Simmons? Um, the, we're we're going to realize that next week is corporate prayer. And uh, actually, the, the next Wednesday, um, I will be in Nigeria. So uh, I won't be uh, uh, going. But I, we are going to go on in Ephesians. And the reason we're going to go on in Ephesians is because we need to see some things and, and I talked about a couple of weeks ago about about the church at Ephesus and and the first love that we needed to stay in. And so I want to go back into Ephesians and see just exactly what was going on and, and what Paul was saw with the, the Ephesians because um there's some things that as we grow in our first love and, and as we grow in the knowledge of God, which is actually what brings us that first love, what we can do is we can build on it with the knowledge of God and who He is so that the name of Jesus becomes illuminated in us, through us, and around us in each and everything that we do. And uh, it will cause the world to uh, uh, grow, thank you, grow into a place that it becomes our place of uh, evangelism. You know, evangelism doesn't take place by uh, what we say. Evangelism takes place by the way we live and the way we act. Excuse me. <clears throat> I, uh, I realized that uh, last Sunday you had a, a great... Uh, teacher on evangelism, on personal evangelism, um, and uh, I hope that everybody got a revelation of, of uh, a place of, of application uh, that that could be used. <clears throat> like I told you before, not th the way that uh, the way that Ann personally does it uh, doesn't fit everybody, but the the concept and the, and the things that she was teaching will always fit everybody. It just the application might be different for you than it is for her in those places. Okay, verse 16 says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. There's a key there. The way that the, the kingdom of God can be preached. Now, how is the kingdom of God preached? We're going to have participation tonight. You may not be used to that, but we're going to have participation tonight. Everybody say participation. participation. Okay. See, now I know everybody can talk. So now we have the ability to be able to participate. Um, what does pressing in mean? You know, in pressing in, I'm not looking for the uh, answer from the dictionary or from the Bible dictionary. What does pressing in mean to you? That's what's important. And, and, and that's what we want to look at. Anybody want to share? Okay, Nancy. A real concentration. Keeping a focus. Keeping a focus. Bearing down. Sometimes that's harder than it seems like, too. To keep a focus, to bear down, to uh, concentrate. Uh, somebody said something over here. Sherry? Deeper in the word. Okay, Revelation comes by being deeper in the Word. See, this is the thing that we have to understand, is all of the things that we, whether it was concentration, whether it was focus, 
uh, whether it was bearing down, uh, we, we realize that there's things that the enemy tries to trip us up with. And it doesn't matter what it is. <clears throat> Can I use you for an example tonight? <laughs> yeah, you do. Actually, I ask you. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you something that, that something... See, and it's not always a negative thing that the enemy is trying to do, but it, it's always something just to get us off of balance, okay? I, and personally, I think this is ignorance gone to seed, okay? If, if, if you, if you want to know the truth. But they called John back to work today. Yeah, seriously. Um, now, I witnessed him using his arm for the first time yesterday and he told me it was the first time he actually turned a steering wheel with it a couple of times and I thought whoa uh it's 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 healing up supernaturally but to me it was ignorance to even ask the man to come back to work right now because you're asking for another problem in a compensation standpoint but when John prays father help me With my attitude, I told him I to, I'd have told him to go kiss a frog. And, uh, and, and, he, and then he said, and then, Father, just take care of it. Okay, but the point in, in that is, isn't anything that happened, by the way, they sent him home. Um, they didn't let him work. But the point in all of that is, it's just another thing to take your focus off, to keep you from bearing down, to help keep you from concentrating. And, and you know, there's little things like that every day. That might not seem like such a little thing, especially right now to Nancy, because Nancy just had a, a, an operation just like that. But we, we understand that there's all kinds of things we can all think about that become something that the enemy tries to take our focus off of pressing in. This is the place that it takes that ability to be able to press in and pray. Be able to pray in the Holy Ghost because sometimes you don't even know what's going on. You don't even know what's going on in, in the spirit realm. You don't know what's going on in a place. I still am asking the Lord what when He woke me up um, at 5 o'clock last Sunday morning uh, and told me, a paradigm shift had taken place in the spirit realm, I still don't know what that meant. But what I know is that means it's time for me to pray even more in the spirit because I don't know what that paradigm shift in the spirit realm was. I do realize that a, a, a shift in the spirit realm is what causes the natural things in the earth to happen. Because, it, because they're spiritually driven, whether by the negative side of the spirit realm or God's side of the spirit realm. The negative side being the demonic side of the spirit realm and, uh, or God's side. There's no in-between. It's either the devil or it's God. And that's the way the spirit realm works. Uh, so we have, to, we have to look at that. Conflict in the kingdom. This is a place that I'm going to read... Uh, if you have your spirit filled life Bible uh, right here, it says uh, for sixteen sixteen it says pressing in, and that's the reason that I ask you, what is your idea of pressing in because it's pressing in, and this is something that the Lord before we read this the, this is something that the Lord really impressed me with the other day, and he said, uh, you know the kingdom of God takes place in a person's life." by the way that they press into the kingdom. Now, what is pressing into the kingdom? It's not heaven. It's the kingdom here. That's the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom of God right here. You remember Jesus said that the, the, the kingdom of God is neither here nor there, but it's inside of you. And that's in, in uh, Luke uh, 7.21. So we realize that, uh, uh, that it's important for us to differentiate between uh, how the kingdom of God uh, goes on. Now, the kingdom of God is preached, but the kingdom of God comes by everybody that presses in. Jesus declares the advance of the kingdom of God as a result of two things. 
preaching and pressing in. He shows the the gospel of the kingdom must be proclaimed with spiritual passion. I thought, wow, let me see who... This is Jack Hayford wrote this this particular uh, note. And and I think about that statement that he just uh, made right here. He he said, uh, with proclaimed with spiritual passion. You know, there's a whole lot of people that are Christians. And they're passionate about religion. But this is talking about a spiritual passion. And that's a, that's, a, that's a love affair with the Father. That's a love affair with Jesus Christ. That's a love affair with uh, no, knowing how the, the entire word works so that we press into that place and, and become passionate about it. Um, that doesn't mean that we get off in, in one ditch on one subject or on one ditch on another subject. It means that we stay right in that place where we're passionate about the entire thing. I'm not passionate about one thing, but I'm passionate about the entire uh, word coming to pass in the earth today. In every generation, believers have to determine whether they will respond to this truth with sensible minds and sensitive hearts. To overlook it will bring passivity that limits the ministry of God's kingdom to extending the terms of truth and love. That is, teaching or educating and engaging in acts of kindness. Without question, we must do these things. However, apart from, number one, an impassioned pursuit of prayer. Number two, confrontation of the demonic number three expectation of the miraculous number four a burning heart for evangelism the kingdom of God makes very little penetration into the world did you hear that without impassioned pursuit of prayer passion pursuit of prayer is not Oh, God, help me. Do you know what's going on now? It's passion pursuit of prayer is, Father, what is your plan for this day for me that I could fulfill that plan so that I can... Do you know what happens when we seek first the kingdom of God? That's what we just did. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be added to you. So when I passionately pursue His plan for this day, then what will happen? Oh God, do you know what's happening? We'll go away. Because now I'm about His plan. I'm not making little of the little problems that go on each day because there's all kinds of little problems. And sometimes I I look and I think, man, it was pretty trivial, wasn't it? But it didn't seem very trivial when it, was in the, when, when it was happening or when I was in the middle of it. But when I get past it, it just didn't seem like it mattered that much. And when we come into that place and we understand that God's plan is for us to fulfill His plan, then what will happen is all the other little things in life or big things in life will change. It, you know, it's almost as easy as uh, as voting. It was pretty easy to vote biblical principles because I knew who stood for biblical principles. And so that was just the way to vote. And when I get in a position that I need direction, then I'm going to passionately pursue prayer and, and, and I pray in the Spirit more than I pray in my known language because most of the time I need direction and I need the mind of God. If there's spiritual things going on in the spirit realm and I don't know what they are, then I have to pray in the Spirit because the Spirit searches the deep things of God that I will have the direction that I need to proceed. Everybody understand? Everybody with me? Okay. So 
passionately pursuing prayer is pursuing His plan and not my plan. Because then my plan comes into His place. Now, I'm not telling you not to have a plan because I, I believe with all my heart that if you do not have a plan, you plan to fail. If you don't proceed with a plan, with, with planned steps, then what will happen is you plan to fail. Well, you just go along with anything that happens. And, uh, but you, your plan can be set in place by, the Bible says that a righteous, uh, the steps of a righteous man are ordered by who? By the Lord. If they're ordered by the Lord, then I need to seek His plan so that I know which direction He's ordering my steps to go. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to go on in this. In, I, I, I'm going to read the rest of this uh, kingdom dynamics because it's, it, it's very important. At the same time, overstatement of pressing in is like producing ra uh, ra rabid fi fanatics who justify any behavior in Jesus' name by applying the boldness spoken of of here. Such travesties in the church history as the Crusaders and various efforts at uh, politicizing in a quest to produce righteousness in society through earth-level rule are extremities we must learn to reject. Pressing in is accomplished first in prayer warfare coupled with a will to surrender one's life and self-interest in order to gain God's kingdom goals. And, and, and that, that is so important what we look at because we can look at, at church history. We can look at uh, most of the time... Uh, You know, and I don't even like to call them this, but, but most of the time a church split or people going in different directions is uh, fueled by they think that they're doing right because we get in a place that we just think that what we're, what we're about is more important than what the kingdom goal is about. And the, what, is, what is the kingdom goal? Does anybody know what the kingdom goal is? That none should perish without everlasting life. That's God's plan. Okay, so how does that plan come about? And that's some of the things we're going to look at through, uh, through Ephesians. Um, I know that uh, in Matthew, uh, the 10th chapter, the 7th and 8th verse, and if you've been here very long, go ahead and turn to uh, Ephesians. If you have... Uh, uh, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, you're going to find that we're going to read some things uh, prior to getting into uh, the book of Ephesians right here in the very front. I, I want you to learn how to use your uh, kingdom dynamics so that you can better under, not just kingdom dynamics, but in the front of every of the books, it tells you what the goal of the book is. And the goal of the book is very important to understand and, and, and even helps you look for some things at how to, uh, to look for what you need out of the book and, and to better understand it. The background on uh, Ephesians was a principal, Ephesus was a principal port on the west coast of Asia Minor, situated near uh, present day Ismar. It's one of the seven churches to whom Jesus addressed his letters of Revelation 2 and 3. Revelant fact for study in this epistle since it was originally circulated to approximately the same group of churches. Although Paul had been at Ephesus earlier, Acts chapter 18, 21, he first came there to minister in the winter of 55 AD. He ministered there for two full years developing so deep a relationship with the Ephesians that his farewell message to them was one of the Bible's most moving passions, uh, passages. Now, 
that, that just gives you the background. But what I want to do is, is I want to look at the, the purpose of Ephesians. And then uh, there's a place, and, and, and you can read this at home, uh, the other part, uh, the content in uh, personal application. But I want to read Christ Revealed. The occasion, or, or the purpose, Ephesians unveils the mystery of the church as no other epistle. God's secret intention is revealed. One, to form a body to express Christ's fullness in the earth. Chapter 1, verse 15 through 23. Two, to do this by uniting one people, both Jew and Gentile, among whom God himself dwells. Uh, That's chapter 2. Uh, 11 through 3, 7. Number three, to equip and empower and mature his people to the end that they extend Christ's victory over evil. And that's uh, three through the end of the book. Now, let's skip over. If, you're, if you've got your Spirit-filled life Bible, let's skip over to... Uh, Christ revealed. This is very important. Every book of the Bible uh, tells you in, in a spirit-filled life Bible, all the way from Genesis through, it'll tell you where Christ is revealed. And in some places, it'll even tell you, oh, it, the, the next page does, it, it, it'll tell you how the Holy Spirit's revealed. Uh, Ephesians is called the Alps of the New Testament. the Grand Canyon of Scripture, and the royal capstone of the epistles. Not only because it's of its grand theme, but because of the majest, majesty, majesty of Christ revealed here. Chapter 1, he is the Redeemer, the one in whom and by history will ultimately be consummated. And he is a resurrected Lord, not only has risen over death and hell, but who reigns as king, pouring his life through his body, the church. The present... See, in that one place of the the personal application, pouring his life through his body, the church, all of a sudden we begin to understand. Ephesians is going to tell us even more how to be evangelist and how to be evangelistic through our lives, because he's pouring his life through his body, the church. That reminds me of of, uh, uh, John chapter 14, verse 12. He says, greater things than I do shall you do, because I go to the Father. And when when we look at that, with him pouring, Christ pouring his life through his body, the church, then we begin to get a revelation of how greater things I'm going to do than, than he does because he goes to the Father. That the Father may be glorified through the Son. That the Father may be glorified through the body. And we see how it all comes in. So you see how Christ revealed in, uh, in this book will bring us to a, a revelation of, and, and, and my prayer is that, and I'm, and I'm sure that most of you have read uh, Ephesians through before. I'm, I'm I believe that that uh, we're all going to receive greater revelation than we've had before, even through the book, because I can tell you that there's particular scriptures that I've preached, uh, one of them that I've preached no less than 100 times, and I, I uh, never fail to learn something new every time I read that same scripture, even though that I've I've preached, and somebody says, how did you preach that a hundred times? I used to do camp meetings and revivals, and I preached the, almost the same five messages all every camp meeting and revival that, uh, that I did. Um, let's go on. The present expression of himself in the earth, chapter 1, 15 through 23. Chapter 2, he is a peacemaker who has reconciled man to God and who makes possible reconciliation of man to man as well. Uh, that's chapter 2, 11 through 18. And he is the chief cornerstone 
of the new temple consisting of his own people to be indwelt by God himself. That's in chapter 2. Chapter 3, he is the treasure in whom life's unsearchable riches are found. He is the indweller of human hearts, securing us in the love of God. Chapter 4, Jesus is the giver of ministry gifts to his church. He is the victor who has broken hell's ability to keep mankind captive. Now, you think about that in relationship to uh, what uh, Jack Hayford said about two things. Passionate pursuit of prayer and learning to bring the demonic under the authority of the believer. That's, that's the first two things he said. So we look at uh, Ephesians and we realize that uh, if he is the victor who has broken hell's ability to keep mankind captive, what has he done? He's given us the ability to set mankind free because the Christ indwells us in that place. Chapter 5, he is the model husband, unselfishly giving himself to embrace his bride, his church. Chapter 6, he is the Lord in mighty in battle, the resource of strength for his own as they arm for spiritual warfare. So let's look at the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in this book because as we realize that what, what, what is the job of the Holy Spirit? What is his job? Okay, one at a time. Who said, did you say something, Sherry? To guide us. Mike, teach us. Glorify Jesus. We're never alone. He illuminates the word in us too. Okay, so that also makes the obligation for me to put the word in so that he can illuminate it. He also illuminates the power of Christ in us. And so it's important for us to understand his work uh, or the Holy Spirit at work in the book because we realize first that Acts 10.38, how Jesus, anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil because God was with him. So we realize there's exactly the the power. Everything that everybody said happens in that one verse, how David Simmons went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. But what did I skip? How David Simmons, anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And that's exactly what the work of the Holy Spirit in each one of us. We ought to be able to put our own uh, self in that position, not saying that we're equal with Jesus, but he was what? Not hard. Firstborn of many brethren. So if he was the firstborn of many brethren then he's my brother, he's my savior, he's my power. It's his name that's above every name. And who shares that name? Say, I do. Say, I do. I want you to get that down inside because it's, it's by the power of God in us working in the earth today that all these other things begin to happen. As Christ... The Holy Spirit is revealed in a widely varied ministry through uh, to and through the believer. Now remember this. In that one statement, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to what? Minister to us, he can't minister through us. We've got to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us to bring revelation to us, to take us to a new place. I, uh, I realize that uh, sometimes it's the revelation that we lack. It's not the knowledge of the Word, but a revelation of the Word. What's the difference between revelation and knowledge? Nobody's used to me asking questions. Did you say something, Sue? Head and heart. 
that's the best explanation we can get. Because I'm going to tell you, you can think it, you can know it in your head, but if it's not here, what does the Bible say? I prayed this when we started tonight. Out of the heart spring the issues of life. You know what? If I got it here, you can talk me out of it. But if I got it here, you come too late to tell me that it didn't, doesn't work. Why? Because I've experienced it, because I've lived it, because the Holy Spirit illuminates it so deep in me that I cannot change and I won't go someplace else. Hallelujah. Are you saying amen or you got something to say? Amen. Okay. <laughs> if you raise your hand, I might ask you if you want to say something. We get so... And, and I'm laying this foundation about Ephesians because I, I want it to, to mean something different than when we just read it. What you'll find if you'll read what we've been reading and actually the whole thing in, in your Spirit-filled life Bible, you'll find out that it, it completely changes your outlook on the book and how you approach the book from the very beginning. Uh, going on, it says he is the sealer the authorizing, the sealer authorizing the believer to represent Christ. That's good, isn't it? Authorizing. You know what? I'm authorized. It's kind of like a, uh, my friend Glenn Smith always said, uh, he says, I, I like to read the authorized edition. Of course, he was talking about the, the King James Bible. Uh, the, and then there's different ones. There's the authorized edition, and he always used the authorized edition. But what that authorizing me, me means is I walk in the authority that's been given to me by who? By the Father, through the Son, so that the Holy Spirit illuminates it inside of me and gives me the authority to do that. I have the authority to use that name like that last song that, that we sang. Um, it goes on and uh, I, yeah, I'll tell you what, that might make me take a running spell. He is the revelator. Actually, he's the revealer. I said revelator for a reason. Because uh, what, is, what is a revelation? Somebody says it's the last book in the Bible. That was John's revelation that Christ gave him of the end time. So I can use that very same thing. If he's the revelator, if he's the revealer, then I realize I can get a revelation just like John got. It's the same Holy Spirit. Does that mean I add to the Bible? No, but I get a revelation of how the Bible works. Your revelation will never be separate from the Bible, but it will always be confirmed by the Word. It will always be confirmed inside of you. It will always make you feel like, ah, I have the power. And, and I've used this example a lot of times, and I'm not handing these keys to anybody. I had a hard time finding them today. I'd give them to my wife, but... Because you hit them? Because you left them on the inside of the door. Yeah. And I prayed. I said, Father, tell me where my Corvette keys are. And I opened the door and I found them right where she left them. Didn't know she left them there. I thought I did. <laughs> but we get a revelation. And it's that simple. It's, a, it's just as simple as getting that revelation. I remember the first time that I asked the Holy Spirit for a revelation. Uh, my my uh, David, who is... 35 years old now, which makes me 14. Um, David, uh, you know, he's just barely big enough to walk. And, and we were at uh, uh, a rodeo at Angels Camp, California. And at Angels Camp, California, you sit on the grass, a hill. Well, he'd been playing with my truck keys. And I'm going to tell you, when the grass about this tall and I, I hate carrying keys so I only carry a couple of keys at a time and so when, my, when he lost my truck keys it was like finding a needle in a haystack 
And I said, Father, I need a revelation of where those keys are. And I got up and I walked right straight to the place and it was, a, it was about 150 feet away where he had dropped them. And he gave me that revelation right then. That's what a revelation is. A revelation that simple of that word, knowing that if you put that key in, in that Corvette out there, that it's going gonna, it's gonna to start it and it's going to run. Um, you know, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. I was asking the Lord if this was a good example, and it is. Um, I got a text from Handsome Harvey the other day, and uh, it said, uh, I've been driving your 32 Chevrolet, and boy, it'll run. And then he told, he told uh, Kathleen sat Sunday, I guess, that he had been driving it, and she says, I'm glad somebody is. And, uh, and I thought about that statement in that place. There's a difference between watching somebody else do something and doing it yourself. It feels different. Um, it operates differently because how Harvey drives that car might not be the way that I drive it or that Kathleen drives it. If Kathleen drives it, you better hang on because I know that she knows how to pr press the gas pedal. And, and so let's take the car out of the issue. Watching somebody else operate by the Spirit of God feels different than if you're doing it yourself. And we can be uh, people that sit on the sidelines and we watch, or we can participate in the kingdom dynamics of... We can read the kingdom dynamics out of the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, or we can operate in the kingdom dynamics. And that's the place that we get in a revelation of how it works. You know, so we say, how, how does all of that come come to pass. All of this has to do with pressing in. All of this has to do with how I'm going to get to the place that God wants me to be. You know what I, what I realize is there's some things as, as I've, I've been studying the end times and, and I've asked the Lord, I said, uh, Lord, what are you waiting for to come? Um, and, and I told you, I'm having a blast. I'm not, I'm not in a hurry for him to come, but I'm not going to complain if it's tonight either uh, because I know that it's going to be even better in that place. Well, he gave me a revelation of two things. It's not his will that any should perish, so he's waiting for to give everybody the last opportunity to come to know him. And he says, I'm waiting for my church to come into a unity. And I said, what does unity mean? He says, I want them to be going in a, in a uh, pressed-in direction with the same common goal. Uh, that doesn't mean we're always going to agree about everything. See, that's a misconception about what unity is. Uh, we may have a, a little different revelation or a little different... Now, that doesn't mean the revelation is, is vastly different. That just means that... I may be more powerful in one area because the revelation that I have and somebody else might be uh, more powerful in another area because of the revelation that they have. And when we put those two together, what have we done? We've brought the body of Christ into a unity because we put those revelations together so that we don't... It's not like my opinion is different than your opinion, but it's how I operate in that place to have the kingdom of God have the power in the earth today that it's supposed to have. Uh, the cool thing about it is, is that helps us bring divine health into our lives. That helps us bring finances into our life. But none of those are the goal. The goal is what? It's about having the power of God come to pass in our life and through our life. He is the spirit of holiness. I'm still reading this the Holy Spirit at work. He is the spirit of holiness who may be grieved by an instance, instant of carnal pursuits. He is a, the fountain from which all are continuously filled. He is the giver of the word as a sword for battle and for heavenly assistant to give us aid 
in prayer and intercession until victory is won. Assistant in that place is capitalized because it's talking about the Holy Spirit being an assistant to us to bring to pass uh, the, the revelation, the aid, the power in uh, intercession until victory is won. Um, and laying that foundation, I, I'm going to stop there tonight because uh, I don't want to start getting into something that... Um, I have to tell you, I know that you don't believe your pastor would do this, but I preached till 10 minutes to 1 last Sunday, so I probably should not get in the habit of going a long time. Um, I thought, whoa, I think their clock's wrong. And then I blamed it on Keith for doing too long of music. So, um, Father, we just I ask this, that as we open the Word, and uh, Father, that as we... Uh, get into the book of Ephesians, Father. I pray that each one of us will gain a greater revelation so that as a power in, the, in these last days, that, Father, we can be effective for the kingdom of God, that the kingdom of God presence will come greater in, inside of each one of us, that we will be able to do great and mighty feats. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus and by his blood, amen. As you've watched today, you've had the opportunity to hear the word preached. And as you apply that word, you'll get victory in your life. But it has to start someplace. It has to start first with a commitment to Jesus Christ as making him your Savior and then making him the Lord of your life. Paul said this in Romans 10 8 through 10. It says, but what does it say? The word is near you and it's in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Well, the word of faith that Paul preached is found in the next verses. It says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you'll be saved. For with a mouth confession is made unto salvation, and with a heart one believes unto righteousness. So it goes like this. All you have to do is actually say, Jesus is my Savior and he is my Lord. So I'm going to invite you to say this with me this morning. Uh, and if you want to bow your head, you can bow your head. The Bible says that pray watching, and so it's okay to keep your eyes open and, and watch. But let's say this together. Say, Father, I know that you sent Jesus to die for my sins. I confess those sins today. I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of those sins and to come into my heart and be my Savior. And I commit today that I will make you the Lord of my life. Thank you for salvation today. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you said that today for the first time, no matter what time of the day or night it is, uh, welcome to the family. Welcome to knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now from this day on, make him the Lord of your life. And as you make him the Lord of your life, you will find out what God can do in you and through you. Also, if you've watched this broadcast, we want you to know that you can become a partner with this ministry. As you become a partner with this ministry, some of the things that you've seen throughout this uh, presentation, uh, the buck outs and, and things like that, then you become a part of that kind of ministry. And there's many people that come to know Jesus. We have offices in Nigeria and Togo, have four churches in Nigeria, one in, in Togo. And uh, we want you to know that you become a part of each and everything that this ministry does when you become a partner. You can see the information right there on your screen so that you're able to become a covenant partner with us. And as you do, we want you to know that we pray over each and every one of your offerings so that God will multiply it back to your hands according to his word. His word says in Luke 6, 38, that he gives back, pressed down, shaken together, running over to make room for more. The New Living Translation says whatever measure you use in giving large or small, it'll be used to measure what is given back to you. So we want you to know 
that God loves you, he'll take care of you, and he'll multiply the seed that you sow in this ground with this ministry. Remember that Jesus is Lord and Jesus loves you and so do we.